Hello and thanks for joining us, starting with an artist who's been dubbed the Japanese Andy Warhol. From the world's top museums to his high-profile collaboration with Louis Vuitton, Takashi Murakami's work is instantly recognisable. His latest exhibition at the Gagosian Le Bourget Gallery near Paris focuses on his monumental paintings. The artist gave France 24's Louise Dupont a tour. Takashi Murakami is Japan's rock star artist, as well as collaborating with famous musicians like Kenny West and Pharrell Williams. His work has been shown all over the world, including Francis Versailles Chateau. Let's go and meet the king of pop art. Wow, this is amazing. Congratulations. <laughs> the suburb, the Bourget. <laughs> You're one of the most famous Japanese artists in the world. Hey. Does the opening of a new show still stress you out? Very much. I have a very much stress every time. But it's a beautiful show. Thank you. Focusing on your monumental art. Yes. This is 23 meters long? Kind of that, yes. What do you like the most about creating huge work of art? So when I make it with a huge painting, the, my favorite part is here. It's uh, hanging a wall in a gallery or museum. Because uh, in my studio is quite tight. Yeah. That means I like, cannot watch into the everything. But uh, now I can see the everything. This is, oh, so my, my painting is, looks like that. So this yeah. is uh, over 10 years ago. I was uh, pretty young, a little bit. And then I did uh, myself to paint. And this is a dragon. Yes, blue dragon, yes. Yeah. Really powerful. The show also features some of your iconic characters, like the smiling flower. Yes. Where does your inspiration come from? I was the art student, art school student, so uh, learning in uh, Japanese traditional paintings. The main theme is uh, snow, moon, and flower uh, without a human being. When I was started to the contemporary art in a Western style of thing, main theme is uh, what is a human being. That's why a combination with a nature flower plus looks like a human something. It's a kind of a mutation in my head. And I think we are in the right room for me to ask about your amazing hat. Oh, this is a uh, kind of tentacles, octopus. Yes, it's amazing. But uh, you see this tentacle, is eating himself. Oh, okay. This is uh, my self-portrait. Me, like, uh, too much hungry and uh, eating each time to the own hand. For this exhibition, you've also prepared an NFT gift for visitors who come to the opening. How has the advent of NFT changed the way you work? I am thinking about the digital world is a new nation. That's why, the, for example, the Fortnite is, a, by the way, so my kids, my children, too much involvement to the Fortnite. And <laughs> I have a big stress, but at the same time, the, oh, this is a new world. Do you think it's gonna change the way the, the art market is working? Oh, I think, uh, you know, NFT art versus the real art is uh, completely different. Maybe another 10 years, 15 years, 20 years, and then finally link, but uh, maybe very difficult right now because the philosophy is very far away. And what about AI? Has it changed the way you, your perception of creativity? Myself is very welcome because uh, a lot of possibility. So that means like a very help for the, for the images. That's why I am very, you know, happy to, you know, using for the AI. But same time to the old school people, 
is uh, a lot of people is lose their job. And are you ever scared that uh, AI will take over the, the world? I don't think so. This is uh, sci-fi. next to a Paris museum that looks at how immigrants have shaped French society. The Immigration Museum has been closed for three years for a refurbishment. It reopens at the weekend. It looks at the history of France by showing the role played by immigrants in the country's economic, social and cultural development. Here's the director of the Palais de la Porte Dorée, where the museum is housed, Constance Rivière. Today, one French person in free is an immigrant, the child of an immigrant or the grandchild of an immigrant. One in three French people is a considerable number, and this museum, in a way, is an archaeology of the present time. How did we become France? Our aim, of course, is to reach out to everyone, and if people who at present are not interested in this history become interested thanks to the museum, thanks to the works of art, and thanks to what we offer, we'll be very happy. We're convinced that prejudice is often born of a form of ignorance. Next, the incredible story of one of the most renowned photographers in the United States. After he escaped the Valdiv Roundup in Paris, which was the largest French deportation of Jews during the Holocaust, Henri Doman crossed the Atlantic, where he became one of the greatest photographers of his time. The faces of the Bronx, the civil rights movement, but also Marilyn Monroe, Elvis Presley and JFK passed under his lens. But until recently, he was a relatively unknown figure here in France, as Gavin Lee reports. Henri Dumas is credited with capturing the essence of American culture, bringing us snapshots of the stars for four decades celebrated across the Atlantic, but until recently largely unknown here in France. Many of his photos now iconic, from Marilyn Monroe's notorious sequin dress, or the king of rock and roll in his office. Not to mention risque portraits of Brigitte Bardot, since reproduced worldwide and the intimacy of the front line of the funeral of JFK. But he also focused on capturing the lives of ordinary New Yorkers. And today at 90, Henri Dumont is regarded as an artisan amongst his peers. It's the photos that matters, not me. It speaks more than words. It's a medium where we can say nothing, but we say everything. When he first arrived in the US, Henri was an independent photographer, choosing his stories based on what he thought would captivate people and think again about certain subjects. A successful photo is a photo that tells a story, maybe to change their opinion of the subject. For example, I did a report in Harlem in New York and the poverty there. It said something more. It wasn't just about the poverty in Harlem. He rapidly began to get noticed and commissioned by America's biggest magazines, Life and Newsweek. It's said with Demand's artistry, along with the charm of his French accent, celebrities were practically queuing up, wanting his shots for their profiles. Like Elvis Presley, marking the moment military service came to an end. Henri's unique view caught aspects of relationships and offered a deeper perspective of the stars. Like in 1960, as to capture the world of professional boxing, he was captivated by something else. I started taking photos of the fight, and then I saw Elizabeth Taylor behind me. She was screaming and crying. I went back to the office with more of the photos of the drama offered by Liz Taylor than of the fight itself. I was inspired by the film star after everything I'd seen of her. Nothing was predestined for Henri, born to Jewish parents in Paris. In 1941, his father was deported by the French Vichy regime and died in a Nazi concentration camp at Auschwitz. Young Henri managed to escape with his mother before they were transferred. Living on the outskirts of the capital, his mother died when he was 13, leaving him an orphan. Henri says he discovered cinema and photography as a solace, a world to lose himself in. He managed to get a basic camera at 17 with his new kit and little else and barked alone for New York. He says that journey profoundly influenced his style. My camera gave me a way out of all the drama that I'd been through. 
I've often chosen to capture stories of oppression, or subjects that I've experienced in my life, the fight for civil rights, poverty, and all the political stories. Henri Demont captured special moments of life through a lens for four decades. His contemporaries regard him as one of the finest in modern America. Next, Paul McCartney has revealed artificial intelligence has enabled a final Beatles song. It's thought to be a 1978 composition called Now and Then. The track was one of several on a cassette John Lennon recorded a year before his death. Two of the songs, Free as a Bird and Real Love, were cleaned up and released in the mid-90s. An attempt was made to do the same with Now and Then, but the project was abandoned because of background noise. When Peter Jackson did the film, get back where it was us making the Let It Be album. And he was able to extricate John's voice from a, a ropey little bit of cassette where it had John's voice and a piano. He could separate them with AI. They could do, they tell the machine, that's a voice, this is a guitar. So when we came to make what will be the last Beatles record, it was a demo that John had. We were able to take John's voice and get it pure through this AI. Now it comes at the same time as an exhibition at London's National Portrait Gallery, and revealing photographs captured by Paul McCartney using his own camera between December 1963 and February 1964. They show what it was like to be a Beatle at the start of Beatlemania. That's all we have time for. Thanks for watching. See you next time. To look at the love and the wonder of what we went through that's captured in a lot of these photographs is the whole thing. It's what makes life great. The Warsaw Ghetto 1943, one of the dark chapters of the Jewish genocide. The 80th anniversary of the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising is very important to me, as it's important to the whole world. For some, it is impossible to forget. People often say to me, move on, move on, but I can't. There's no fresh start. But in Poland, memory of the event seems to be fading. Somehow it's a silent acceptance of growing hate. The Warsaw Ghetto. 80 years later, revisited on France 24 and France24.com.